so much. What a mouthful. <clears throat> so welcome to the Self-Empowered Wisdom Conference 2021. And our, our theme this year is Emerging Stronger. So I wondered, what the heck does that mean? And how do you do it? That's what I'm interested in. How do you do it? And like probably many of you and many of you that are watching online, I've been to a lot of conferences. In addition to that litany of things that I've done, I've been to hundreds of these things. And I would go, you know, my first conference, I think Greg Braden had hair about out to here. <laughs> and there were 15 people. That's how long ago. I think it was in the 80s or the 90s. And I would come to these conferences and I would hear things and I would hear people and I would say, yeah, that's exactly what I'm looking for. That's what I got to do. And yet I couldn't change. I couldn't change. So I wanted to talk about how we change. And so if we're going to talk about self-empowered wisdom and emerging stronger, like, let's talk about what that is first. Then we'll talk about how to do it. So when I think about emerging, so emergence means to like come into prominence. Something is like birthing, evolving, uh, Hawaii's birth emerging out of the sea. It's a natural phenomenon. It's like us in our evolutionary journey. We're emerging. We're emerging all the time. So I don't know if it's about emerging stronger or figuring out ways that are impeding our emergence. Because if we're all part of the one spirit, there's only one thing going on on planet Earth and in the whole cosmos, and we're part of that. So the individual expression of the divine doesn't feel like we have to emerge stronger. It just feels like we have to emerge in our natural way. And then emergence is this word that I came upon, and emergence is this phenomenon where living things that come together will form a group consciousness. So like a flock of birds will all of a sudden turn, or a school of fish does the same thing, or a colony of ants. These are a collective consciousness. And what's interesting, that's also describing what's happening in our bodies. So you're looking at me, you think there's one thing going on up here. Actually, I'm a colony of 50 to 100 trillion cells, all doing their own thing. And when those things come together, they form this emergent system that is self-regulating, self-referencing. And the phenomenon, as above, so below. Isn't that what all of nature is? Nature is an emergent phenomenon, self-correcting. So is my body. So really, if we want to think about emerging, it's like, what's impeding us from doing that? And you might be wondering, with all these amazing speakers that we have lined up, all these authors and famous folks and researchers and people around the cutting edge of technology, and you know, we got Sonny Dawn coming up, who's the author of umpteen zillions of books and all the kinds of things, why would Karen ask me to be up here to address you this morning? And hopefully a couple reasons, but one of them is, I'm exactly like you. I've been coming to these conferences and without even knowing it, something longing in my heart, you know, my life looked okay, part of it, you know, you heard the other part. Um, <laughs> part of my life looked okay, you know, I had people that loved me, I had a job, I had this, I had that, but I would show up at these conferences and I'm longing, right? And finally, I was able to break the momentum of all the reasons why I couldn't change. My job, my this, my house, my mortgage payment, my drug habit, blah, 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 fill in the blanks. It doesn't matter what those blanks are. It doesn't matter because we all have them, and they're all real. The second reason why I think Karen invited me here is because she mentioned the sanctuary in, in her very gracious introduction of me. And the sanctuary is a mental health facility. And it's unlike any other mental health facility on planet Earth. And it, because it emerged, it's not something we did. It emerged. 
So I want to share the story about that. And because I've lived and worked for the last 17 years in a mental health facility, I've had the honor and the privilege of sitting across from thousands of people that are stuck. And I'm talking about people with debilitating depression, suicidality, attempted suicide, PTSD, like abuse and things that have happened to them that you read about, and people with anxiety and addictions of all sorts. And yes, these people come in, by the time they find us, they've been working on this. You know, they've tried. And they're desperate, right? Like this is death or change. This is the place that they're in. And I've watched so many not be able to do it. And really, in all of the constellations of diagnoses, so people come in the door and they've got a whole plethora of things wrong with them. And really, what we have found is there are a handful of core archetypal human wounds that we all share. And these are wounds of the soul. And unfortunately, uh, the diagnosis of soul sickness is not in the DSM-5, and it should be, because it's the granddaddy of all wounds. And so these wounds, the core archetypal wounds are separation, abandonment, abuse, betrayal, something's wrong with me. So let's just talk about those for a second, because in one way or another, many, many, many share those things. And these are the archetypal issues. So I don't fit in, I don't belong, I'm forsaken by God. Somehow the mechanism of the universe applies to everybody else, but it doesn't apply to me. And that's going to show up like, I'm lonely, I don't fit in, I don't belong. I can blend, but I don't have like, like a home. I can't find my tribe. Abandonment sounds frivolous in some way. Oh, I've been abandoned. Actually, we have circuitry in our limbic brain from way back when. If we were abandoned by the tribe or kicked out of the tribe, that was certain death, let alone the humiliation of, of that that people would have in their heart. But you would have to fend for yourself. So when we are abandoned, that is like, that hits us in these deep limbic brain places. Abuse, you know, it's, hey, it, it's different than falling and getting hurt. Somebody's hurting me, whether they're conscious of it or not, and it's happening again and getting, inflicting this pain. I am not safe. Betrayal. I put my belief, all of my beliefs are being challenged. And that's what we're having on planet Earth right now. And the last one is, I'm defective in some way. My heart won't open, my brain thinks, I got a chemical imbalance, this is not happening, that's not happening. These are the archetypal wounds that lead to something called soul sickness. And soul sickness is this phenomenon where we look at the soul, and I've sat across from thousands of people, and I ask every single one of them, what is the soul? And some people have these amazing responses, you know, like, like Rumi would have said, and some people are like, I don't know. But every single one of them acknowledge that it feels important. And every single one of them seem to understand that this is our essential self. That underneath all of our wounds and pains and addiction, that the soul is like the seat of really who I am. And somehow, when the world does not support that, I'm on the playground and I want to be a ballet dancer and all the kids make fun of me and laugh at me and I go, well, I better talk about football. Or I get abused or something happens to me and I get further and further and further away from who I really am. And we call that soul loss. And that is the granddaddy of all wounds. And our soul will then manufacture crises to get our attention. And right now, as Karen alluded to, hey, we're coming out the other side, hopefully, of a crisis, the coronavirus, whatever that is. And no matter what you think about the coronavirus, you could be totally mainstream coronavirus over here. Yep, exactly as they said in the news. You could be totally against the mainstream dialogue. Hey, it's, none of that is true. Doesn't matter. 
because corona has affected every single human being on planet Earth, believe it or not. And I can tell you the crisis, that's not the crisis that we're facing right now because the aftermath of the corona is going to be a million times worse than the corona. When mortgages start to get defaulted on, people start to get evicted, families don't have income, don't have health care. This is the crisis afoot. But the real crisis afoot is actually the Pachacuti, which is the turning of the Earth. We're in a phase shift right now on planet Earth, which means that all the old structures are not supported by the new energy. So anybody that's familiar with the, the science of cymatics, um, that's where a vibration will create a shape. And as they turn up the frequency, the shape becomes more complex. So if I try to artificially manage that shape and I let go, it's going to go right back to where the vibratory frequency holds it. And that's what's going on on planet Earth. That's why we're all coming to these conferences. Because we want to be in alignment. We want to be in alignment with this new energy. So let's talk a little bit about how I got here. Because I'd say about 20 years ago, give or take, I don't know, I'm sitting in a drug rehabilitation center, and I've been in a lot of those, as Paula had mentioned. Um, and when I was in those things, I worked hard. So my addiction, I had two lives going. I had a life where I had people that cared about me. I was at work every single day at 6 o'clock and worked 16 hours, seven days a week, every single day for seven or eight years. And I've got this mondo drug habit going to the tune of $200,000 a year. That's after-tax money. <laughs> <clears throat> I couldn't even deduct that. I couldn't even put it as a deduction on my tax return, you know. And so I don't say that to, like, like impress anybody. I say impress upon you, like, this is a person who doesn't feel well. And, and I didn't even know it. So I'm... In, in a drug rehab center, and I'm there for a couple of months, and I get a call from my wife at the time who says, we have to go to Sedona. And I'm like, why? She goes, I don't know. <laughs> so a couple of weeks later, she calls me, and we weren't speaking too much then, you know, you can imagine. And, <laughs> and so she said, I just got a postcard in the mail, and Greg Braden's speaking in Sedona. So I'm like, okay, so I go to my counselor and I'm like, I need two weekend passes because I got a big work project and I got to go to Sedona to see Greg Braden. And the guy goes, you know what? I'm only going to give you one. So 99.9999999 times, I'd have gone to work. But something told me to come here. And I think it was this conference, and we were with the Hilton back then, and, you know, I see all this inspirational stuff. And there was one speaker there that day, this shaman. And I was in a room with 500 people, and this dude is talking, and he is talking to me. Now, I know the other 499 people are having that experience as well. But nonetheless, this guy's like, and some voice out of nowhere says, this guy is important. I think it was my wife. But... <laughs> But nonetheless, some voice came, so I'll just say that's the voice of spirit. So this voice, and I later became his student, and after that, I've been, as Paula said, a teacher on his staff for the last 20 years. And the next thing I know, I'm buying a house in Sedona. So I live in Philadelphia at that time. I don't have the money to buy a house, because you understand where I'm spending all my money. And, but something tells me, buy this house. So I buy it online. That's the weirdest thing. They, people weren't doing that back then. So I buy this house online, not knowing. And the next thing I know, I wind up in rehab again at the same place. And my counselor tells me, look, I can't help you. So they send me to Arizona to my last and the worst treatment center I have ever been in in my entire life. And I'm sitting there, and two important things happened. Number one is, it occurs to me, you know what? This is not the way this is supposed to look. Like, I'm not the only one that's not getting well here. Like, this is not 
happening. And I've been to some of the best treatment centers money can buy. And nobody's getting well. The second thing that occurred to me, I'm looking at my counselor, and I have a flashback of every counselor I have ever sat across from because I was so desperate to get well, man. I paid strict attention. And when somebody said, read ten, one book, I read 10 books. When somebody said, I mean, I was so desperate to change. So I'm watching all my counselors go by, just like Ghost of Christmas Past, Charles Dickens, you know, one by one. And it occurs to me, these are well-meaning people. But are they well? Have they overcome? And I don't mean just change behavior. I mean have a cellular shift that they are no longer what they were. Because that's what I want. The second thing that occurred to me, and this is, I think, the, the choice point. I'm sitting there thinking about all these people, and I'm like, I know more about this problem than any counselor I have ever sat across from. Because I've been in treatment for 20 years. I've been all over the world studying with mystics, shamans, clerics. If I heard about some doctor in Zimbabwe that could help me, I'd go see him. So I realized, holy smokes. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go create a treatment center. And here's the interesting thing about it. I didn't know how to create a treatment center. I didn't know the first thing about how to do that. And there was no model for the treatment centers that I was looking to find, so it had to emerge. So you know what I did? I let it happen. And I did the most bizarre, crazy things that you could ever imagine because when I got the inspiration, I said, okay, that's what I'll do. We were, so we were in construction. The next thing I know, we got we to build a labyrinth. Stop construction, build the labyrinth, build the garden, all kinds of stuff that makes no sense. But this place wanted to emerge. It wanted to emerge. And the sanctuary is a, it's a community. It's a place where, I mean, I've lived and watched people overcome horrendous things in their lives to go on and be free, to actually signal their body epigenetically to manufacture different proteins and grow new bodies that do not have depression, anxiety, sickness, and addiction. Show them how to do that. Because, you know, all we had to do is allow our self-correcting systems of the body to do their thing. Because when we intervene on this self-correcting system, if the intervention stays present too long, it's going to set something else out of balance. So we've got to intervene, get in and get out, so then the system can reorganize. If I don't do that, whatever intervention I use creates a different imbalance somewhere else, and that's called a side effect. That's called a side effect. And so, I want to talk about a couple of things, and you're going to hear some amazing stuff over the next two days of your lives. And you're going to hear people give you techniques, and you're going to hear people give you inspiration, and you're going to hear people that are going to download the Word of God right to our ears. And there's a couple of things that if we don't do, we're always going to be bumping into the things that stop us from our full expression. Because that's what emergence means. Full expression. So in my line of work, you know, I can tell you that nobody starts using drugs because they're in pain. People start using drugs because it feels good. You know, they can dance better. They have courage to talk to a member of the opposite sex. So that begs the question, what is it about my belief system, how I feel about myself, that prevents me from doing that? My inhibitions. That's what's preventing me from emerging. All those little stories that tell us what we can and cannot do. So I'm going to give you four little things to think about over the next couple of days that we have refined over the course of the last however many years 
And here they are for you. If we want to change, what we have to do is we have to become the storytellers of our lives. Because if we're not the storyteller, we get embedded in the story. You know, we think that we are the mind, right? So we have to be the storyteller. And we have to start to learn to tell stories of victory, not victimhood. Stories of what's going to happen to me, not all the things that have happened to me. Stories of passion and purpose. And if you want to control your story, you've got to control the storyteller. And that's that little narrator in your mind. Because that little voice in your head is going to dictate exactly what you're going to do all day, every day. So when I have an idea, oh my God, I'm hungry. Where's my body? In the kitchen. When, oh my God, I have to go to the bathroom. Where's my body? In the bathroom. Oh my God, I'm stressed after work. Where's my body? Having a martini. So this little voice in here, many of us just let this go unchecked. So we've got to be the witness of the storyteller and make sure that that person is telling the story that you want to be part of. Otherwise, we're caught in the global story. Right now, there's a virus, it's going to kill me, there's food shortage, there's this, there's that, there's 50 million reasons why I should be terrified. That's not a story that I'm interested in. And I suspect that's not a story that you're interested in either if we're sitting here. You know, that's a story that doesn't feel right for me. Just like my own addiction story, as Paul is sitting here talking about all that stuff, I'm like, oh my God, that's not me. That stuff is so far disconnected from me, like, until she said it, I didn't even remember 90% of it. Like, it's gone, because I'm, no I'm no longer that. I've grown a new body that doesn't include that. I have a new story. Second thing we have to do is we got to check in with our beliefs. we got to be belief busters, because a couple of things about your beliefs, and I'm not talking about your choices. Oh, I'm a Christian, you're a Catholic, he's a Hindu, he's this, I'm a vegan, she's a vegetarian, he eats meat. Those are choices. Our beliefs are the context that we place on every single thing around us. So a baby comes into the world, daddy, car, apple, pear, teacher, bad, good, and don't go there. Those are the assigned meanings that we have put on everything in our lives. And our beliefs are all in the shadow, so they're invisible to us. And they're the ones driving. What you're wearing today is tied to a belief. If you brushed your teeth this morning or not, it's tied to a belief. So if you brush your teeth, it either whitens your teeth, freshens your breath, prevents cavities. If you didn't brush your teeth this morning, oh my God, I gotta go see Sunny Dawn, so I gotta get there on time, and I don't have time, I gotta check out of the hotel, and I gotta get over to the Creative Life Center, or we just didn't care. If you use fluoride, it makes your teeth nice and hard. If you didn't use fluoride, I never put that in my mouth. It's a neurotoxin, are you crazy? I promise you are not sitting in front of your bathroom mirror thinking about all that. You either did or you didn't. And that's what our beliefs do for us. They tell us what to do and what to not to do. And here's the tricky part about your belief system, because it's imperative to our survival. So beliefs are imperative to survive. So all my beliefs are doing is reconciling the outside world to what I know. And as long as these things correlate, I can navigate the world around me. And I won't get hit by a car. I won't get. Yeah, I can find food and find shelter and find a mate and procreate and do all that kind of good stuff that I'm programmed to do. So I'm very defensive about my beliefs. <clears throat> That's why people now with the, I love the virus talk because everybody gets so angry, right? And, you know, we get so mad because, hey, wait a second, if I have a point of view and you have an opposite point of view and you're saying my point of view is wrong, that means my framework in the world is faulty. I'm not safe anymore. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get mad. <laughs> you ever notice that? People get mad. That's a survival skill. But we don't know that. The second thing about our beliefs that's really important is there are self-fulfilling prophecies. So you're going to go out of your way to validate your belief because that's, again, what keeps us safe. So if I have a belief that I am unworthy, it does not compute that I have all these awards on my thing, so I just ignore them. We can look at 
Robin Williams, probably a good example of this, right? Guy has all the accolades, all the love, all the things. Killed himself because he believed that he wasn't worth it. So that's the power of our beliefs. So we have to be belief busters. And if your life is not exactly the way you want it to be, there's something back here that's standing in your way. So at the sanctuary, you know, we have people that are killing themselves, and we could care less what people believe, but something that they believe is killing them. Something that I believed was killing me. So we got to check in on our belief systems. Third thing we got to do is we got to have a purpose, right? Our life needs to be about something. And if we think about this self-regulating system, what happens is it it's creates everything in the system has a purpose. So nature is this self-regulating system, and everything in nature has a purpose. If you go out hiking in Sedona, you'll see this bug feeds this plant, this plant secretes something that this thing does, this thing does that, that does that. This bird eats this little thing and poops it out over there, and a tree grows. Everything has a function. Everything is connected. Everything has a purpose. Everything is feeding the whole. We need to do that. We are part of that. So what's so interesting about my path is that how do we create the sanctuary? We watched nature. We emulated nature. So there's nobody in charge of the sanctuary who's ever got the idea they're in charge. So there's, it's, a, it's a horizontal structure. There's no authority figure there. It grows as it wants to grow. We all live there, so we're watching for which way spirit wants to, wants to emerge. We're watching the vacuum that nature will always fill. Because that's the nature of nature. So we need a purpose, because it gives our lives meaning. A purpose is a soul thing. And whatever you decide your life is about is what it's about. Whether it's good or bad, you get to decide. And the thing about purpose is that every single person on this planet is born with something, some task that they can embark on, and this task is impossible. And only when they embark on this task do they become that which Spirit sent them here to be. So we call that destiny. And it's been said that everybody has a future, but very few have a destiny. If we want to overcome these giant barriers, having a destiny, you know, having a purpose. And the last thing I'm going to share, because we're running out of time, is that if you wonder what your purpose is, and man, I spent decades wondering, what am I doing here? And as I was getting close to my death, the most terrifying thing was for me that I wasn't going to complete my mission. And I didn't even know what it was. But it irked me more than being dead, actually. If you want to know what your purpose is, let's tap into the hero's journey. And the hero's journey is this process where when we overcome our biggest challenges, we develop our greatest strengths. That's the hero's journey. So in that day when I'm sitting in treatment and 20 years of treatment, 30 years worth of addiction, shame and self-loathing and all the secrecy involved in that. And I'm sitting there across the table from this counselor and I, it occurs to me, that was your training, man. That was your training. You are so kind of equipped for this mission. <laughs> and Michael Beckwith, I heard him one day, I think he was standing right here. He said, you know, God qualifies the called. God doesn't call the qualified. So that's me. I didn't know the first thing about what I was embarking on. And we have developed a treatment center. We used to be the laughing stock of treatment. People would be like, Pfft. they're not doing that anymore. Our model has percolated out. Big hospitals are taking stuff from us. And you know what? That was our mission, to make that happen. 
So whatever your personal struggles are, as we overcome them, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, that's going to give you the special medicine that nobody else in this room has. Your piece of this amazing symphony of life that only you can sing. That's what spirit wants from us. Greg Braden, good mentor. Karen, good mentor. She's been mentoring me. Karen's like my surrogate mother, you know, she's been watching over me for 20 years and I tell a lot of stories about that. <laughs> anyway, so this, this part of overcoming and emerging stronger is all about getting over the inhibitions and allowing our individual soul song. And so for me, you know, my old life of working in business and all that stuff, I'm a teacher. That's what I am. That's what my soul came to this world to do. And you know what I teach people? I teach people that there's nothing wrong with them. That there's nothing wrong with them. That all we have to do is let this system correct itself. And I teach these people to save their own souls. Because that's what I know about. And I can tell you the reward for that is watching all of these unrehearsed moments of connection, of where people get something, where they are signaling their body in a different way, where a family will connect in that first moment. And it's like, oh my God, it's like witnessing birth. The birth of a soul. And when you see that, man, that's the greatest drug that I've ever experienced on planet Earth. And that's what we're all here to learn how to do. And Sunny Dawn's going to be coming up here in a few minutes, and she's going to give us some of the keys to, to, and on this journey. And then we got Kelly Alexander coming tomorrow, and all kinds of things going on. So thank you for spending some time with me, and I, I hope our time together was as valuable for you as it was for me, and thank you so much.